Greetings and welcome back to 303. You are in your hymnal now on page 40. And we are turning now to a close reading, C-L-O-S-E, a close reading of the Beowulf epic. We are reading a translation by Burton Raffle. And we are looking now at specific sections from this poem. On page 40, we will be looking now at a line-by-line -line reading of the text Beowulf, and more particular, particularly the section that your textbook company calls The Wrath of Grendel. Before we get there, though, let's jot down a little bit of information at background. Now, as we work together, I will make observations that are both level one, two, and three. I will try and point out what those observations are at those three different levels so that you can then jot down your, an your annotations accordingly. All right. You have a sheet of paper in front of you. You've already created the annotation form with numbers down the left-hand side of 1, 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B. Yes. So now we'll begin to work through this. And we're just going to start with some background information that you might reduce to a single line at level 1. Let's read it together. When Beowulf was composed, again, I'm reading on page 40. When Beowulf was composed, England was changing from a pagan to a Christian culture. Pagan Anglo-Saxons told grim tales of life ruled by fate, tales in which people struggled against monsters for their place in the world. The missionaries who converted them to Christianity taught them that human beings and their choices of good and evil were at the center of creation. Beowulf reflects upon pagan and Christian traditions. The selection opens during an evening of celebration at Herat, the banquet hall of the Danish king Hrothgar. Outside in the darkness, however, lurks the murderous monster Grendel. Let's take a couple of quick notes just as background information at level one. We are in the land of the Danes, D-A-N-E-S. We are at the Hall of the Great King Rothgar. Rothgar is enjoying drinking his mead, beer, alcohol, with his thanes or warriors. Okay. Everything is going great. Now, just to remind, this mead hall is built like a gym, okay, with a large area under a single roof. And a fire pit usually in the middle to keep them warm and to cook their food. On one end of the hall is where the king sits on his throne. On the other and around the, the hall is where the thanes or the warriors will sleep. All right? We now will go to the reading itself. We'll read a few lines and then we'll report at level one what we read. Okay? Grendel, let's put it in our notes at level one. Grendel is our first of three monsters in the Beowulf epic poem. Okay, We're going to have three monsters in the Beowulf poem, as we've already said in summary lectures prior. Let's go to work. A powerful monster. Page 40, read along with me. Again, I challenge you in our reading together to really look at every word. I'm trying to help you improve as a reader. And one of the ways to do that is to actually practice reading. So let's go ahead and see if you can keep up with my reading. Right? Let's go to it. A powerful monster living down in the darkness growled in pain, impatient, as day after day the music rang loud in that hall. The harps rejoicing call, and the poet's clear songs sung of the ancient beginnings of us all, recalling the Almighty making the earth, shaping these beautiful plains marked off by oceans, then proudly setting the sun and moon to glow across the land and light it. The corners of the earth were made lovely with trees and leaves made quick with life, each with each of the nations who now move on its face. Let's pause for a moment and write down at level one. Very simple. We are going to be told two things. One, in the hall, where they all associate or congregate, the poet loves to sing songs. What are these songs about? Creation and the wonders and glories of creation. Number two, we are told a powerful, scary monster named Grendel 
does not like the singing. Does not like the singing. Okay? We can think at level 3A of any number of examples from stories and movies of monsters or dragons or trolls or whatever that don't like it when humans are happy. They're sad all the time, these monsters. They don't like singing. They don't like dancing. They don't like fun storytelling. They are grumpy. Let's just say it. Grendel is a grumpy monster. Doesn't like it. Back to the text. I'm at line 14, uh, 13 and 14. And then, as now, warriors sang of their pleasure. So Rothgar's men lived happy in this hall till the monster stirred. That demon, that fiend, Grendel, who haunted the moors, the wild marshes, and made his home in a hell, not hell, but earth. So let's just point, pause for a moment. We're told that Grendel is our monster and that he will notice several words here. He haunted the moors. Let's write down the word moors. The moors are going to be like desert only with water there. Okay? So they're going to be kind of really scary places. All right? I'm on page 42. We're reading now about Grendel and where he came from. Line 19, by the way, just to point out, you can see those little numbers down the left-hand side. Every five lines will give you a number which can quickly allow you to find where we are. I'm at line 19. He, Grendel, was spawned in that slime, conceived by a pair of those monsters born of Cain, murderous creatures banished by God, punished forever for the crime of Abel's death. Now let's pause for a moment for your notes and jot down at level 3a that this is a reference to a Christian story from the Bible called the Cain and Abel story from, write it down, Genesis chapter 4. Our story is an interesting one in the Bible. It says that there were two brothers named Cain and Abel and that Cain got mad at his brother Abel and he killed him. For the murdering of his brother, God will curse Cain. We're not told what that curse is, but notice that in our story Beowulf here, that curse is understood to be Cain became kind of like a monster of sorts and produced monsters. Notice we'll continue at line 23, 24. The Almighty drove those demons out and their exile was bitter, shut away from men. They split into a thousand forms of evil spirits and fiends, goblins, monsters, giants, a brood forever opposing the Lord's will and again and again defeated. Let's just pause for a moment and point out at level 2a, this is going to be for the Beowulf epic, the origin of evil. Why do bad things happen? What we will call later the theodicy question, T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y, the theodicy question. Why is there evil in a world created by an all-loving, all-powerful deity? And the answer is because these monsters originate from the great sin of Cain. All right. So if there are monsters, by the way, sometimes the Moors were called bogs, and therefore the monster that would slide, slide around in the bogs was called the boggy man, Later, of course, the boogie man. Now, it makes sense that if this is a region where children can go out and get trapped and fall into the quicksand and die, you would tell them stories that would probably scare them away from those areas. Grendel will come from those scary places where they are haunted and water is there. It's not a good place. It's a really bad place. I'm at line 30 now. Our storyteller would continue. Then... When darkness had dropped, Grendel went up to Herod, wondering what the warriors would do in that hall when their drinking was done. He found them sprawled in sleep, suspecting nothing, their dreams undisturbed. The monster, we could write down at level one, sneaks into the hall. This is significant. Notice, there are no war warriors awake. Everyone is asleep, right? Probably why? Because they've been drinking too much, right? They've been drinking too much. So let's take a look. The monster's thoughts 
were as quick as his greed or his claws. He slipped through the door and there in the silence snatched up 30 men, smashed them unknowing in their beds and ran out with their bodies, the blood dripping behind him, back to his lair, delighted with his night's slaughter. Whoa, let's just pause for a moment now at level one. Grendel is a monster that comes in and he will destroy, slaughter, notice, 30 men. Let's write it down. So he is a terrible monster, right? He eats 30 men. Let's point out, we are not told why he does this other than he is just a bad guy. That is all. There's no other reasons for it, okay, given for us. Grendel is just a bad monster who does bad things. Now let's pause for a moment here and point out a couple of observations for your notes. First of all, let's notice it 2A. This is going to be an introduction here to an idea about why bad things happen. Sometimes evil just exists the way it is. Bad things happen, as they sometimes say, poop happens, right? Let's also point out here that notice at 3A, a title that maybe you can write down. Who is the worst monster you know of? Jot that down in your annotations. It might be in a video game. It might be in a movie. Who is your favorite, that is to say, your worst monster? Okay. The scariest monster of all time for you is, jot it down. Does it come from a video game? Does it come from a movie? Does it come from a TV show? Some of us will say, it's interesting, the word monster and the word villain often goes together, right? So, for example, I can think of really bad villains. They're not actually monsters as in another creature. They're humans, but they behave so terribly that they go from being a villain to being a monster. Yes? Can you think about one of those kinds of really bad villains in a movie? Okay. So we're told that he comes in and he drags those bodies back to his lair. Let's write down that word, lair, which simply means his place where he lives. Okay? Why would you do that? That's, uh, that one you can jot down at level one, at level one, right? Jot um, at, at his lair. Okay? Notice we're told, interesting line, at line uh, 40, he's delighted with his night's slaughter. In other words, he's a monster that actually enjoys killing humans and eating them, okay? All right, let's keep going. Line 41 on page 42. At daybreak, with the sun's first light, they saw how well he had worked. And in that gray morning, broke their long feast with tears and laments for the dead. Hrothgar, their lord, sat joyless in Herod, a mighty prince, mourning the fate of his lost friends and companions, Knowing by its tracks that some demon had torn his followers apart, he wept, fearing the beginning might not be the end. And that night, Grendel came again, so set on murder that no crime could ever be enough. No savage's soul quench his lust for evil. Whoa. In other words, let's pause for a moment at level one. We're told in the morning when they wake up, the ones who are remaining, they're really sad. Notice the king even weeps, cries. He's so sad. But it's probably just not sadness. What's the other emotion that's probably associated with here? Fear, right? Fear. In other words, oh no, will he come back? Sure enough, he does come back. Grendel comes back again and again to repeat the slaughter. Let's point out. There is nothing the warriors can do to defend themselves. They can't fight against this. This is a force of nature they cannot defeat. And this will be significant for our study later. Notice, then each warrior tried to escape him. I'm at line uh, 53. Then each warrior tried to escape him, searched for rest in different beds as far from Herod as they could find, seeing how Grendel hunted when they slept. Let's point this out for level one. This is a monster that likes, is nocturnal, likes to kill in the dark when everyone is sleeping. Makes him an even more scary monster, right? <clears throat> Notice, then each warrior tried to escape him, searched for rest in different beds as from Herod as they could find, seeing how Grendel loved, hunted when they slept. 
distance was safety. The only survivors were those who fled him. Hate had triumphed. So let's write it in our notes at level one. By the time we get to line 60 or so, <clears throat> we are told Grendel has won. No one wants to go back to Herod Hall. No one wants to be a part of what's going on there. So, line 5960. So, Grendel ruled, fought with the righteous, won against many, and won. So, Herod stood empty and stayed deserted for years. Twelve winters of grief for Rothgar, king of the Danes. Sorrow heaped at his door by hell-forged hands. Let's just pause for a moment. For twelve years, Herod Hall empty. Why? Because the monster Grendel has made everyone so afraid. No one wants to be there anymore. It is a bad time. Not a good time, a bad time. Let's pause for a moment at level 2A and notice. Notice how in this poem we go from it being singing and happy, right? Yay, everything is great, to no one even wants to be there anymore. It's a bad time. Things are not going well at all. Of course, let's point out, at level 2B, what is really happening here? Our poet is setting up the, sh the emergence of our hero. You gotta have a, what's the name of our poem? Beowulf, the great hero. So you gotta have a villain, a monster, and then of course you gotta have the hero to come and fight against the villain or the monster. We could of course jot down really quickly already at, at 3A, couldn't we? Our favorite movie or comic that plays this game already, right? That is to say, your superhero shows, right? By the way, I should point out, this is the beginning of Batman. This is the, this poem. This is the beginning of Superman. This is the beginning of Spider-Man and all of the DC comic and Marvel comics that you're familiar with. This is the beginning story of that kind of story where you gotta have a bad guy or a monster and then of course you gotta have a hero and you can kind of predict, can't you? There's gonna be a moment of a fight, isn't there? You gotta have the fight, you know that it's coming. Notice we continue. We're told that Rothgar, king of the Danes, sorrow heaped at his door by hell-forged hands. Line 64. His misery, Rothgar's, leaped the seas and was told and sung in all men's ears how Grendel's hatred began, how the monster relished his savage war on the Danes, keeping the bloody feud alive, seeking no peace, offering no truce, accepting no settlement, no price in gold or land, and paying the living for one crime only with another. No one waited for reparations from his plundering claws, that shadow of death, Hunted in the darkness, stalked Hrothgar's warriors, old and young, lying in wait, hidden in mist, invisibly following them from the edge of the marsh, always there unseen. Let's point out a couple of things here quickly. Things are now going very bad in the country. No one's taking care of each other anymore. Fear has led to people doing bad stuff. And let's also point out, that now we will have a certain kind of rumor that starts to spread. People will start to be told, dude, you don't even want to go near that place. All kinds of terrible things happen. By the way, do note the translator's insight on page 43. A normal feud involves two sides. It takes two to tangle. Literary lore suggests that monsters are interested in fights. They know they will win. You should point that out for your notes. Grendel is, likes a fight. He, he knows absolutely certainly that he can win. All right? We'll go now to, to line 79 on page 43. So, mankind's enemy continued his crimes, killing as often as he could, coming alone, bloodthirsty, and horrible. Though he lived in Herod when the night hit him, he never dared to touch King Rothgar's glorious throne, protected by God, God whose love Grendel could not know. But Rothgar's heart was bent. The best and most noble of his counselor of his council debated remedies, sat in secret sessions, talking of terror, and wondering what the bravest of warriors could do. And sometimes they sacrificed to the old stone gods, made heathen vows, hoping for hell's support, the, dr the devil's guidance in driving their affliction off. That was their way, and the heathens only hoped. 
hell always in their hearts, knowing neither God nor his passing as he walks through our world, the Lord of heaven and earth, their ears could not hear his praise nor know his glory. Let them beware, those who are thrust into danger, clutched at by trouble, yet can carry no solace in their hearts, cannot hope to be better. Hail to those who will rise to God, drop off their dead bodies, and seek our Father's peace. Let's make a couple of quick observations. One, for your notes, let's point out that although Grendel comes into the hall, he will not touch what? He will not touch the throne. Why? Because the throne of a king is protected by God. <coughs> Number two, we are told Rothgar is deeply worried. He thinks this is the end of his kingdom. He thinks this is it. In other words, notice the irony. Let's jot it down at, at, at level 2b. There is irony here, right? Grendel can't touch the throne, but it doesn't matter because Hrothgar it can't sit in the throne anymore. He doesn't feel like a king anymore, really, right? He feels all alone. Finally, let's notice that at the very end of this passage, we have a couple of observations about people. Let them beware of those who are thrust into danger, clutched at by trouble, yet can carry no solace, no comfort in their hearts, cannot hope to be better. Let's point out something for our notes really quickly at 2a. The Beowulf poet seems to suggest that you don't have to die to go to hell. Hell is living in a situation from which there's no escape. Hell is living in a situation from which you can't hope to be any better. Whoa, very interesting idea. Let's say it out loud. Hrothgar is in hell. He needs someone to help him. Who will help the king? Notice he says, hail to those 